collect the eggs. So there was a natural phenomenon uh, that was um, having a return to normality. There is, um, there is models in there for what we can practically do. There are people in the world today uh, or already the dominant system is saying to the to the psychologists and the political scientists in the in the universities, use the concept prefiguration to go searching what the buggers are doing on the margins, the Spencers and Tylers of the world. And they're using the word prefiguration it is how are people living the future that they want by how they live now? And they were identifying prefiguration in the Arab Spring, in the in the protest movements down in South America. So there are people. That's an old notion. Live now as you would want the future to be. And uh, one of the first things that they attempted to shut down is local, like local friendly societies. It used to be the health insurance in England, the the loyal uh, uh, orange. Uh, odd fellows and the Rechabites, uh, local friendly societies. Magic involves making the improbable possible. It's learning how even the slightest change you can make, you, yeah, it's learning how even the slightest change you make can have a radical effect on the internal system of your psychology slash spirituality and the external system of the environment and universe you live in. That's essentially the core of this book. Um, we are talking about magic, not stage or sleight of hand magic, but actual, you know, causing change in uh, accordance with will. You know, the, the essential definition of magic that uh, has kind of permeated the culture out there. Well, that's a good starting point. Um, we're dealing with technology because words are technology and approaches can be a technology. We're dealing with a technology that is so highly advanced and that you don't see all the moving parts inside that essentially the way that you have to approach it as, is, as if this is magic. Yeah. There are beliefs which can function socially without anyone believing in the first person. Like, allow me to repeat, I hope you don't know it, another wonderful story that really happened in my country in the 70s, ex-Yugoslavia. Uh, there was enough toilet paper in the stores. But a rumor started to circulate that there will be a shortage of toilet paper. So, now comes the beauty. What happened? People in contrast to what we usually assume, did not distrust powers. They accepted it that there is enough toilet paper. But they reasoned in this way. But what if there are some idiots who really think that there is not enough toilet paper? So, to make it sure that they have it, they will start to buy it like crazy, and there really will not be enough toilet paper. To prevent that, it's good for me now to go and buy a lot of toilet paper. So you see the point? Nobody believed that there really is not enough toilet paper. It's enough to presuppose that there is another one who believes in it, and uh, at the end, the result is the same. I will not bore you here with the standard stories of, that I like to repeat of, uh, uh, of this uh, belief of, of look, Santa Claus, you know, like, ask parents, do you believe in Santa Claus? They say, of course not, I'm not an idiot, I buy the presents. You ask children, do you believe in Santa Claus? Of course not, so why do you act as if, well, not to offend my, my parents and to get pre You know, like, there are numerous examples of this belief which functions socially, beliefs, without anyone in the first person believing in them. Nobody believed that there really is not enough toilet paper. It's enough to presuppose that there is another one who believes in it, and uh, at the end, the result is the same. Magic involves making the improbable possible. At the end, the result is the same. Live now as you would want the future to be. Because, well, this is a powerful tool in this marketplace, and this is part of the reason this dynamic of mimetic rivalry where the two sides begin to look like each other
because when the successor ideology exposes these powerful tools in this fight, well, the reactionary right just can't help but use the ring. We might call it Barrymore. Understanding that the reactionary right wing of evangelicalism is expressivist helps to explain a great many things. The, cent the centrality that vibes play in the movement, and it does. I mean, a big deal with someone like Doug Wilson is his vibe. The flamethrower, flame um, you know, what is it, No Cover November. I mean, all of this stuff. It's a vibe. Driscoll was a vibe. So it's expressivist. Again, this is this Girardian mimetic rivalry. If you engage the other side and you look at what's helping them win and you say, yeah, I'm going to use that so we win, you become like the enemy. This is central. When I, when I tell people again and again, if you're going into a culture war, study Jesus. He lived within one and figure out how to engage in your culture war like Jesus. And suddenly, even though you say, I believe in the resurrection, you look at the cross and say, well, that doesn't really look like a winning strategy. Well, line up there with the Muslims, because that's what they think, too. And what, what you see, for example, in Europe, we now have a, a shift to the right, especially in young people. And you got to watch that left right stuff, man. It's the same fucking bird. But you, you well, it's, it's kind of interesting because you could anticipate a kind of right backlash to um, to the default culture based on this kind of internet memory. Like, like it's, it's the art has um, foreshadowed the cultural development in a sense. Um, and I mean, I, this is what I, uh, what I personally um, connect with all of this uh, keck and, and, and internet memes stuff and it's incredibly interesting. If you're going into a culture war, study Jesus. He lived within one. And History doesn't show humanity being particularly good stewards of its technological power in any meaningful definition of good. Um, the, that we use increasing technological power to increasingly exploit the environment, other classes, other people, it's pretty clear. And uh, what I would say is that we don't get to continue to utilize the power of technology in those types of ways as exponential technology comes online without self-terminating. And so the type of mind that gives us the ability to make the tech is not the same type of mind that gives us the ability to um, regulate it and steward it wisely. And that type of mind being able to catch up with and guide, direct, and bind the other is uh, critical to humanity making it through its technological adolescence. Okay. All right. So this brings us to the topic of multipolar traps. This is a underlying feature of what drives many of the major problems in the world, both uh, in terms of market issues, environmental issues, military issues, many things like that. And without being able to solve uh, this underlying feature more fundamentally and categorically, none of the uh, specific areas find adequate solutions. So I want to make sure we understand this. Uh, if you want to read up more on it, there's an exceptional paper online called Meditations on Moloch on Slate Star Codex. That's probably the best overview on the topic I'm aware of. So what do we mean by a multipolar trap? We mean a multiplayer prisoner's dilemma uh, or a situation in which you've got a number of different actors that could be different nation states, different corporations, different tribes, uh, whatever it is, uh, who can be in a competitive dynamic with each other, where if any of them do a particular type of action, that if everyone does that will kind of be, create the worst case for everyone long term, but will create so much advantage for them in the near term that they will win enough power that everybody else loses if they don't also do the thing. And so if anyone does the immediately advantageous, though long-term harmful thing, everybody else has to race to do that thing. Well, in our ecology of practices, notice what we're doing. We're always trying to find complementary sets of strengths and weaknesses, trade-off relationships, and get everything into tonos, everything into this creative tension with everything else. 
These ten letters bear a very close relationship to Parmenides. If you take Parmenides, Plato's Parmenides, and he has what are called the nine hypotheses. All right? And guess what they are? The first, second, third, fourth, fifth. The first is called the one. The second has been given the name intelligence, being, etc. Soul, body and soul. and matter, or unformed, non-living, right? Two, three, four, five. And then, there's the denial of these. The denial of the second, the denial of the third, the denial of the fourth, the denial of the fifth. That is to say, he whips out a great metaphysics where he shows you can understand the nature of the one. He gives you the logic and the tools necessary to understand intellectually intelligence, the soul, body and soul, matter. And then these are the arguments against it, which, the, which is a rejection of each of those points in the sequence that I just made. So, one is pure, stands alone. Two, you can actually, if you'd like to see it in a figure, I think of it in a figure and I'd like to share that with you. Stay there. You can put the second, third, fourth, and fifth hypothesis, which represents each one of those, and their denial Therefore, you can study both how to affirm it and how to deny it, how to affirm it, how to deny it. Then you can see the relationships going any number of ways you want. It's extremely well organized. And each one of these can be re represented in this uh, great structure. Uh, Proclus says, you know what? You should get into Plato's Parmenides. That's the true mystical teachings of Plato. And in that magnificent work and the theology of Plato, he lays it out. Boy, I got into that one. And you can see, here's the whole thing. Our problems as represented in philosophical midwifery are in essence an imitation of enlightenment experiences. What? Yeah. What well, what did it say? I said the human problems especially belong to a certain class called the pathologos. Pathologos is the name we give to unsuspected beliefs we have learned in our youth, which we've never articulated and never found the source of them, but we adhere to them because we have been in, we have been in we have been captured by our parents and people who brought us up. And when they appear most brilliant, most sincere, and give us their family teaching one way or the other, they look so magnificent. They say, hey, the self emerges. They're imitating a profound state of mind that they never get into again. The child looks at that and goes, wow, that's my dad and mom, wow. Everything I've seen before is not real as this is. Therefore, they make conclusions from that. All those conclusions are fictions, our lives, which we live out and don't know. Philosophical midwifery goes to the roots of those and discovers those fictions that have ruined our life and undercut our success and our achievements and make us a victim.
Now, Jesus didn't act like a psychotherapist and sit down and try to sort all of this stuff out. Jesus just basically tells them, you all have to go. Well, we're, we don't throw us into the abyss. And throw us into those pigs. Okay, go into the pigs, and the pigs all then go into the lake. The story's in the Bible. It's a very famous story. And, and I'm not saying that all of us who have pieces of us are possessed by a demon or a spirit or something like that, a, male a malevolence. But we do experience that dividedness as malevolence often, because what we want to have is, this is the word we use, integrity. We want all of our different pieces to be integrated, and we don't want to be triggered, and we don't want to suddenly become our father when someone says something or does something. We don't want to become our mother when someone de says something or does something, or maybe we do. But you begin to realize that the virtue and the excellence that your father or mother possessed and exhibited was something that they actually grew and it was an achievement. Maybe part of it was inherited. And, and over the last five years of doing this internet ministry, I've been able to realize a lot of the good that I've inherited from my father. And I didn't even know I was inheriting it. But, but usually when people go to a therapist, they're, they're looking for things that they have inherited from the outside that they wish to resolve in them. So now maybe they can be in a situation where something happens in a marriage and they don't fly off the handle and break things or yell or storm out or, or go get drunk or, or go get a hooker or something like that. Um, I mean, people do all sorts of things. So psychologically, this is part of the reason why we're Churches will sometimes have therapists on site or on staff or, or send people to therapy because, well, you really don't want to keep playing. You don't want that. You don't want your father to keep possessing you when your mother, when your wife says something or your child does something. And you don't, you want to resolve that part and you want to be conformed to a different norm.